We all know that Five Nights at Freddy's William Afton is a crook. I mean, this dude has exactly two character traits, those being is purple and does murders. But for whatever reason, he was never caught for his crimes. Apparently the police just never had enough evidence to convict him of the several dozen murders that he committed. Even though it kind of feels like there was a lot of evidence. I mean, it was pretty obvious, guys. Uh, but just because we can't pin those murders on him, that doesn't mean that he's safe yet. Like how Al Capone was eventually arrested for tax evasion. Today, I'm charging William Afton with a dozen counts of being a complete moron. This is every engineering crime committed by William Afton. Richard, hit that intro. Most engineering crimes fall under the umbrella of what is called gross negligence. If you, as an engineer, make some sort of mistake when designing a product that compromises its safety, you, as the engineer, may be held responsible when someone gets hurt. Gross engineering negligence is defined as a failure to behave with the standard of care that a professional engineer of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the same circumstances. What? Uh, basically, it just means if you screw up so badly when designing a product that other engineers are like, Bro. Williams made a lot of mistakes in his various designs, but in order to figure out which ones are considered criminal and which ones aren't, I need to call in the help of an expert. Hello. It's me, it's, I'm the expert. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. The same thing that William Afton does. Well, not the same exact thing though. And throughout my time in engineering school and in the field, I learned a lot about the engineering process and how to avoid mistakes like these so I don't, you know, go to prison. So. In order to determine whether or not William has failed to behave with the standard of care that is expected of him, we first need to understand what is expected of him. And to do that, we need to understand the standard engineering design process. I say standard, it's really not, I mean, it's not standard at all. There's like 50 different versions of it, depending on who you ask. But for simplicity's sake, today we're gonna be looking at the simple three phase design process. Any engineering project starts with the requirements phase, where you lay out your problem statement and generate a list of requirements that a successful design must meet. Next is the design phase, where you, well, you design stuff. And lastly is the verification phase where you build a prototype of your design and test it to see if it meets your initial requirements or not. If it doesn't, you go back to the design phase and tweak some stuff until you have a finished design. I think it'll be a lot easier to understand this process if you see it in action. So let's take a look at it in the context of my favorite thing to dog on here on the channel, the spring lock suits. We'll go through the process step by step and see what William did well and where he went wrong. I'll do the same thing for all of William's weird and wacky inventions, tallying up every example of gross negligence that I can find to get a final rap sheet for your boy William. And hopefully any budding engineers out there will learn how you can avoid making these same mistakes yourself. Spoilers! It's really not that complicated. The first step of the requirements phase is to identify your problem statement. In this case, William wants to allow the animatronic performers to interact with the kids in the audience to increase immersion and sell more pizza. Now that we know the problem we're trying to solve, it's time to lay out the requirements. This is basically the rubric that you'll use to judge the final design against. Getting these right is very important because they affect everything you do 
for the rest of the project. Generally speaking, there are three main requirements that are included in every project. Those being cost, reliability, and safety. Cost is pretty obvious. You don't want to spend more money than you need to. Now, I've seen a lot of people argue that maybe the spring lock suits were made as a cost saving measure. Instead of having to buy a separate animatronic and costume, you just combine them and get two for the price of one. Except in this case, the one is like 10 times more expensive than the two could ever be. It's hard to know how much exactly a spring lock suit is going to cost without knowing all the components within it, but to put it in perspective, if you want to buy a single animatronic and a separate costume, it would cost you somewhere between $8,500 and $10,000, depending on how fancy you want to get with it. In order to make a functional spring lock suit, you're going to need to buy all the spring locks, which aren't cheap, hardware to attach them, ratchet bearings to pull them back, custom animatronic parts, because you know you can't just tape them to a regular animatronic, you need test stands and prototypes for the R&D phase, all the time it takes to invest in actually designing it, all told, if you think you're going to get a functional spring lock animatronic for less than $30,000 conservatively, you're crazy. Now, obviously, you're not gonna go to jail for making something more expensive than it needs to be. I just thought it was important to call attention to this to remove any possible excuses for William. He's not a cheapskate. He's not a shrewd businessman. He's just an idiot. The next standard requirement that's always included is reliability. This is a measure of how long a machine's gonna last before you have to start replacing stuff. As a good rule of thumb here, the most reliable part in an assembly is the one that doesn't exist, right? A part can't break if it isn't there. The fewer parts an assembly has, the fewer things can go wrong. And these spring lock suits, well, they got a lot of parts like probably four to five times more parts than a regular animatronic. Now, having a complicated or finicky machine isn't inherently criminal, unless, of course, that complexity compromises the safety of the person operating it. And that brings us nicely into our third requirement, it's safety. It's pretty clear that William does not care about safety. I mean, dude's a serial killer. But here's the thing, even if you are a morally bankrupt businessman who doesn't care if other people get hurt, you know what you probably do care about? Money. Taking literally 30 minutes to sit down and consider the safety of your design is free. Getting sued because your robot turned your employee into jelly is very expensive. I don't care if you're a multi-million dollar corporation, not getting sued is always better than getting sued. There are a lot of things you can do to test the safety of your product, but probably one of the most important ones is called a failure modes and effects analysis, or FMEA. The idea is that you list out all the ways your machine could break the failure modes, and then determine all the things that could happen as a result of that failure. Every product will break or fail at some point, but the idea is to design it in a way to fail safely. As an example, just a hypothetical, if you identified one of the failure modes of your machine as it gets a little too wet, and the effect is that the person inside is crushed and stabbed to death from every direction, I mean, maybe you change a couple things. I've seen a lot of people in the past try and excuse William for this, saying, oh, it only failed because it was old, it was too wet, it had been sitting in the back room for years, that's why it failed, does not matter. This shouldn't have been a remote possibility. And the fact that William didn't consider this or willfully ignored it makes him guilty.
Those three requirements are included in every project, but you also want to add in some more specific functional requirements that define what exactly you want the thing you're designing to do. In the case of these spring lock suits, we can infer two more functional requirements that William seems to have designed around. First, he wanted to keep the time to change from animatronic mode to suit mode as low as possible to maintain the illusion that the character on stage simply stepped off and into the audience. So he designed these spring lock suits in a way where you could quickly crank them all open, hop inside, and be ready to go. Now, technically, there's nothing inherently wrong or illegal about this requirement, though I do want to point out that he literally has not accomplished this at all. It would take way more time to crank open a suit and have someone climb inside instead of just having a guy in another suit ready to go. Animatronic finishes performing, curtain drops, doors open, and hey, there he is! Again, not a crime, still very dumb. And lastly, it seems that William wanted the stage version of the animatronic and the suit version to look as similar to each other as possible. Now, I understand the thought process here, you don't want kids figuring out the trick, but this is a bad requirement from the jump because it's poorly defined. Instead of trying to come up with some way to measure how similar the two need to be for nobody to notice, William chose to require the animatronic and the suit to be identical down to the last atom, which is totally unnecessary. Now this may seem like a case of just another dumb decision that's not technically illegal, however, William has clearly prioritized this requirement over everything else. He compromised the safety of his animatronic to allow him to use the same suit both on and off stage, which any reasonable engineer would agree is totally irresponsible and unnecessary, aka CRIME! So those are the five requirements that William seems to have been working off of. Some he clearly cared about more than others. Next, for the design phase, you need to select a design parameter to fulfill each requirement. If you are designing a car, one of your requirements is it has to move, so the design parameter would be the wheel. In the case of William, we can see that the design parameters he selected were spring locks, spring locks, spring locks, spring locks, what? This is a clear-cut example of what is referred to in the engineering world as a golden cow. This is when an engineer likes a particular design or mechanism so much that they insist on shoehorning it into places where it doesn't belong. At best, this design philosophy results in a less efficient, more costly design. At worst, you accidentally turn your mascot costume into an Iron Maiden. Whoopsie. So by my count, these spring lock suits alone contain three instances of gross negligence, where William has failed to follow the established engineering process, creating animatronics that are far more dangerous than they had any need to be, which resulted in a death. Of course, uh, it was his own death, so you know, there's that. And also for anyone who thinks that William designed the spring lock suits to be super dangerous on purpose, I mean, he was the only one who ever wore it, so don't really know what the plan there was. So now that we all have an idea of how this process works and the types of mistakes that qualify as grossly negligent, let's go through a bunch of William's other brilliant inventions and all the colossal blunders he made along the way. Golden Freddy, or Fredbear if you prefer, is another spring lock suit, so it's got all the same issues as before. But on top of those, William decided to select a motor or piston for operating the jaw that has enough force to crush a human skull. 
This indicates to me that one, he did not properly define a minimum requirement for the motor strength required here, resulting in him selecting a motor that was way stronger than it needed to be. And two, he did not identify this as a source of possible danger in his FMEA. Probably because he didn't do an FMEA. This thing was intended to be used in a restaurant with kids. They're gonna stick some stuff in his mouth, and you gotta be ready for that. All of the other regular animatronics from FNAF 1 and 2 are, surprisingly, not that bad. I mean, as far as we know, they were totally safe and didn't cause any problems until he started killing kids and shoving their bodies inside. Which, you know, is still a crime, but not an engineering one. It's actually way worse. The fun time animatronics are an interesting case because they were designed by William with the express purpose of kidnapping and murdering kids. For that reason, going through these to look for cases of negligence feels a little redundant. These things are doing exactly what William designed them to do. He designed them to commit crimes. I do have to question his plan here though. As I understand it, these animatronics were supposed to be rented out to birthday parties where they would go out, capture kids, and bring them back for William to experiment on their souls or whatever. And then the rest of the people at the party were supposed to be like, dang, that was pretty wild. I mean, that. do you see that? Do you see that? Whew. Anyway, what's up with this cake over here? Also, and I'm just a, just a thought here, but if I were designing robots to kidnap and murder kids, first of all, I wouldn't, because why? Why would you do that? But if I did, I probably wouldn't write my name on the damn blueprints. Moving away from the animatronics, I've talked in the past about those weird doors from the first game that absolutely eat electricity and defy gravity. Now, these things are technically not that bad. They were designed to ensure that employees wouldn't get trapped in the back room when the door slammed shut in a power outage. And you know what? That's great. You know what else could have solved this same problem? A fucking door. Like, it's a pretty good solution for a problem that doesn't actually exist. Now, some people argue that the doors were installed for the express purpose of protecting the person inside from the animatronics. First of all, if that were true and Fazbear knew that their robots were roaming around murdering their employees and their solution to protect them was to install some super expensive doors but not to give them enough power to keep them closed, I mean look, I'm not a legal expert or anything, but I gotta imagine that's some sort of crime right there. But also, if you know that your restaurant is filled with robots that will murder anyone on site, why do you need a security guard if they're just gonna cower in the back room all night? Or, or, if you hired the security guard so that you could kill them as a part of your messed up experiments with Remnant, why would you give them a door to begin with? No matter how you slice it, this whole situation is very dumb. And also, very illegal. I recently did a whole two-parter about how Glitchtrap is basically just a crappy version of ChatGPT that William made because he was too dumb to learn how it actually worked. Now, I won't rehash that all now, but safe to say, yeah. Very negligent of William to design an AI that you literally cannot stop from doing something. That's just about all the things that we know William has built without getting into any of the books or movies because I don't really want to read 50 short stories just to sit here and tell you, oh uh, yeah, building some tiny robot fish that swim around in your blood and control your brain is pretty bad. So far, things aren't looking too good for old William, but there is one more wrinkle here that we have to consider that I'm sure a bunch of you have already written scathing comments about. What about William's business partner, Henry? 
yeah, that's right. I didn't forget about him this time, commenters. No, 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 no. Don't delete it. Own your mistake, all right? I can see when you delete stuff. So I'll call you out and I'll let everyone else know that you tried to correct me before finishing the video and we're all gonna make fun of you. While we know that William and Henry were business partners in some capacity, we never really get concrete confirmation on who designed what. Now I could spark a flame war by trying to speculate which man designed which thing, but ultimately, it doesn't actually matter. For you see, we haven't yet talked about the third phase of the engineering design process. The verification phase. A lot of people don't realize, but engineering is a very collaborative process. There's never just one engineer on a project. You've always got a bunch of people checking and reviewing each other's work. You have to hold these things called design reviews, which are kind of like when you had to present your BS science project in front of the whole class, except now it's in front of a bunch of grown men yelling at you and trying to make themselves seem super smart by questioning you on the most obscure little details that have nothing to do with the scope of your project. No, you're having PTSD. So it doesn't actually matter who physically designed what thing. If they were working together, then they would both know exactly how these things work. And if neither of them caught these mistakes, then they're both negligent and they're both guilty. Look, I don't care if the books describe them as geniuses or great businessmen. If you look at the facts of the case, William Afton and Henry Emily are both complete and utter morons. Your Honor, I rest my case. So, to wrap it all up, based on the information that we've been given in the games and some very basic investigation, I'm hereby charging William Afton with 10 counts of gross negligence resulting in severe injury or death. He's also guilty of designing and producing machines with the intent to kidnap and murder. I have no idea what the legal name for that type of crime is, and you know what? I don't really want that showing up in my search history. As for Henry, we know he was involved with the creation of the spring lock suits in some capacity, making him guilty of at least eight counts of gross negligence, which resulted in at least two deaths. Enjoy life behind bars, boys, cause you ain't never coming back. Hopefully you all enjoyed the video and learned a lot about the engineering process, the importance of checking your work, and how to not be a total dummy. See you next time. This video was made possible by all my amazing patrons, including Alakazam, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Alberung Freud and Selican.